a good Erev Shabbos. Listening to a Torah class as we drove along the thruway on our summer trip, we heard a story from about 100 years ago about a meeting between two rabbis, one from the Russia-Belarus part of the world and one from Germany. German Jews were generally inclined toward more Western mannerisms, while Russian Jews, by contrast, seemed uh, generally less connected to the social graces uh, of the society where they lived. As a consequence, for example, a German Jew might open a door for a woman and allow her to go first, while a Russian or Lithuanian Jew might go first himself, based on the Shulchan Aruch's concern for the immodesty of a man walking behind a woman. So it transpired that a rabbi from Russia was once visiting a rabbi in Germany, and he entered the room ahead of his rebbitzin. The German rabbi gently chided him, saying, Herr Rabbiner, Frauenrechte? My dear rabbi, what about women's rights? Apparently, this caused the rabbi from the East to burst out in tears at the perception of his lack of sensitivity. The story brings together a few elements that are on my mind lately, this week. Firstly, German Jews, of which the late esteemed precious Mr. Kurt Rothschild, Zichron Levracha, was one. And also the idea of Frauenrechte. In America, the current topic is women's rights. Although I wasn't paying too much attention to the news while we were on holiday, this is what people were talking about. And what do you know? It fits in quite well with a central incident in our Parsha of Pinchas this week. In our weekly Sedra, we encounter five women whose names may or may not be household names. Machla, Noah, Chagla, Milka, and Tirza. They are the descendants, sorry, daughters of a, uh, of a descendant of Yosef named Tzalafchad, who may get his name from the two words Tzel, Pachad, the shadow of fear. In short, these women are bringing to Moshe's attention in the conversation about apportioning the land of Israel once the Jewish people settle in it, the fact that their father has no male heirs and therefore stands to lose any share in the land, according to the letter of the law, as Moshe explains it. Moshe takes their plea to the Almighty, who praises the daughter's initiative and says that they have spoken correctly, and God instructs Moshe as to how these women are to receive a share in the land. It's a brief saga of courage, initiative, and righteousness. And as always, there is more than meets the eye. The daughters, apparently, or at least according to one opinion, are listed in the Torah in order of their accomplishments. Yalkut Shimoni claims that Machla, Noah, Chagla, Milka, and Tirza, uh, whereas uh, are, are in or that order in this week's parsha, whereas at the end of next week's dual reading, they're listed in birth order, which would be Machla, Tirza, Chagla, Milka, and Noah. Alternatively, Rashi tells us that they're listed here in one order, there in a different order, to emphasize that they were all equal in wisdom. The daughters mention in approaching Moshe that their father, who's, who had passed away by this point, his death was not the result of Tzalafchad being a party to Korach's rebellion that we read about a few parshas ago, although it doesn't seem clear that even that offense would have caused Tzalafchad's estate to forfeit inheritance of a portion uh, in the land of Israel. Uh, in fact, we might understand that apportionment of a share in the land was granted by God to the second generation simply as a result of being part of that generation. In other words, uh, that their parents were the ones who left slavery in Egypt or uh, on whom wandering in the desert for 40 years was decreed. Yet it was their children who were to inherit the land. That share would have passed to the son, a son of Tzlovchad, had there been one. The daughters merely protested that their father's name, his descendants, would lack a share in the land solely on that basis if the daughters did not stand to inherit their father's portion in the land. Their anxiety was based on apportionment to men only, which Akedas Yitzchak was simply predicated on the fact that men themselves were the ones to serve in military campaign, in the military uh, co conquest and settlement of the land of Israel. We're going to have a similar conversation in next week's Parsha with regard to the tribes of Ruvain and Gad, who wanted a share outside of Israel, as they were not so interested in taking part in the battles until Moshe rebuked them. The Gemara and Bava Basra, which is the basic source, our basic uh, locus for understanding much uh, of this passage, praises the daughters of Tzlovchad on many accounts. It says they were wise, it says that they were astute interpreters of Torah, and it says that they were righteous. 
First of all, note that these are three different praises, right? One may have one of them without necessarily having the other two, this Gemara suggests. Their wisdom is shown in their advancing their petition at an auspicious time, which is right when the apportionment of land was the topic of discussion. They were astute interpreters of Torah as evidenced by their mention of the laws of inheritance in that if they had had a brother, they would expect land to be apportioned to him. But in the absence of any such male heir, they would assume the rights of an heir to their father's inheritance. And thirdly, their righteousness was shown by their patience to be married, according to this Gemara. They waited for the right partner rather than rush into any marriage that came down the pike. So says the Gemara in the context of a wider conversation about this case. Machla, Noah, Chagla, Milka, and Tirza approached Moshe Rabbeinu with their request, having already petitioned within the established system of Batei Din, of courts that Moshe had established. The Abarbanel explains that these lower courts demurred, saying that they could only render a verdict in cases where the law was clearly stated, whereas here, no law had been pronounced specific to this situation. Interestingly, Moshe himself may have had to recuse himself from judgment on that case because the daughters indicated that their father was not among the rebels in Korach's band of revolutionaries. This meant that Slovkad was a supporter of Moshe's leadership. In a dedicated show of impartiality, Moshe removed himself from rendering a decision that involved children of his supporters, just as he would have done had the petitioners been children of those who rebelled against Moshe's leadership. Let's end the suspense. God instructs Moshe that uh, he give them, that, that they be granted, the daughters be granted a hereditary portion in the land of Israel, and their claim is just and right. Moshe didn't know this because it was not revealed to human knowledge until this moment in Jewish history, meaning that it was specifically because the daughters advanced their claim that this aspect of halacha came to light. Between this and another significant protest earlier in Chumash Bamidbar, which was the protest of those carrying Joseph's bones, remember, who they lamented their missing out on the chance to offer the Paschal sacrifice. And they were granted Pesach Sheni, the makeup Pesach, second Passover, if you will. We learned that it's worthwhile to speak up. And it's just to ask, demand for our share in the mitzvahs. Fact of the matter is, in this case, the daughters received not just one allotment, but actually three, their father's share as well as what their father inherited along with his brothers from their father, and thirdly, an extra share Tzlafchad was entitled to as a firstborn, according to the Yalkut. Rashi explains at the outset of this incident that it's placed deliberately after the census of B'nai Yisrael to emphasize that the decree of the spies, namely that the generation should pass away before the new generation entered the land of Israel, applied to the men, but not to the women. Why? Because among those of the spies who protested that they would not be strong enough to conquer and settle Israel, some of the men said, let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. And since that verse back in Parsha Shalach begins, Vayomer ish el achiv, each man said to his brother, it seems clear that this whole panic was among the men exclusively. By contrast, Rashi points out, Jewish women were saying things like, we want a portion in the land. Give us our portion, as evidenced by the daughters of Tzlovchad that we're discussing. Our Parsha also records the message that other than Joshua and Kalev, it says not a man from this generation will enter the land. Not a man will enter, which implies that many women from the previous generation did in fact make it through the 40 years in the desert to inherit and settle in the land themselves, not the least of whom was Serach Bas Asher. Rabbeinu Bachia points out a logical component to their argument. If the daughters have the same right to inherit, then let Tzlovchad's daughters inherit their father's share. If not, then let the laws of leveret marriage be applied to their mother, namely the law of Yibum that's discussed uh, at length throughout Tractate Yibamus, whereby a woman who's widowed without a son marries a brother-in-law to preserve her late husband's name. Let that happen, and in that way, the father's inheritance, Tlofchad, Tlofchad's inheritance, will be preserved through that marriage. That same Rabbeinu Bachia infers from the letter Nun in the phrase, Moshe brought their case before God. It says, Vayakrev Moshe et mishpatan lifnei Hashem. The Nun 
at the end of the word, their case, mishpatan, indicates the number 50 in Jewish numerology and gematria. Specifically here, the 50th Sha'ar of Bina, the 50th gate of wisdom, to which Moshe himself was not even privy over the course of his lifetime. Human beings normally attain at most, at best, only 49 gates of wisdom until, that is, Moshe's last moments of life when he did reach that gate and he died on Mount Nebo, Nun Bo, it says. There, in the, as his life came to a close after 120 years, he reached that 50th gate of understanding, which should be some comfort, at least at some point, the questions become clear. To carry that idea further through, although we will read of 42 journeys next week in Parshas Masay, the Zohar's opinion is that there were actually 50 journeys of Bnei Yisrael from Egypt to Israel, supported by the 50 individual unique mentions of the exodus from Egypt throughout the Chumash. It follows then that the tale of the daughters of Tzlochad bringing their case to Moshe Rabbeinu and a new aspect of Torah being revealed as a result of the daughters speaking up for themselves takes place on the 50th and final journey. This is further supported when we note that the Nun of Mishpatan, their case, like we mentioned before, is a Nun Rabati, a larger than normal final Nun, only one of 16 such large letters in the entire Chumash. It must be emphasizing something. So we make the connection between an out of ordinary letter in the Torah to an out of the ordinary situation in the laws of inheriting the land to an out of the ordinary and even ultimate achievement, attainment in human knowledge and understanding. For those less inclined to such a mystical interpretations of events and, and words, you can just accept Targum Yonason's explanation that in this particular case, Moshe deliberately consulted with God to demonstrate to future generations of judges that they should never fear, never be embarrassed to seek counsel from higher authorities when confronted with a perplexing case of halacha. However you choose to view the story of the daughters of Tzlovchad, there's no doubt on several accounts that the land of Israel was, is, and always will remain precious in the eyes of a Jew. There's no doubt that we are allowed, even encouraged, to ask for what we want and what we need, even when there are challenges or obstacles that seem to stand in our way. Also, it seems clear that Hashem is ready eager and even pleased to hear our requests and to help us fulfill our destinies in this world. Over the last few weeks, we've been discussing the Book of Numbers, or Bamidbar, in the wilderness through the lens of bewilderment. At the same time, not everyone is bewildered. There usually remains some, a few among us, with a clear vision and a sense of direction as to how things should proceed and develop. It's good to pay attention to their actions and their words and follow them. And the righteous women of Israel, in this case, as frequently happens, lead the way. Have a good Shabbos.